My name is Paul. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming. I did want to introduce my two uh, sort of panelists, uh, co-presenters. I'll just hand the mic over. So, Stephen Azeka, I am a program officer, part of the Robinhood Learning and Tech Fund. So, we are a we're private philanthropy that's focused on fighting poverty throughout the city. And I specifically focus on investing in several different nonprofits, primarily around the computational thinking and computer science space for elementary school. Hi, everyone. I'm Tom William Lynch. I'm the Education Policy Director at the Center for New York City Affairs at the New School and also Editor-in-Chief of a website called Inside Schools, which provides information about New York City schools to families and the public as well. I asked Steve and Tom to, to be on this panel because uh, we are all passionate about curriculum in, 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 in our schools because we feel like one, it's a, it's really important. Like, it's, for example, Steve has been uh, funding work of mine at CUNY because I work specifically on teacher education to try to integrate computer science or computational thinking into schools. And so, what curriculum is being used is just important to figuring out how we do that. Tom is talking to and, and like reporting to families, and I certainly think families are interested in what curriculum are being used with with their children. And then, as I'm thinking about teacher preparation, and we're sending teachers, student teachers undergraduates that are learning how this all works, have a lot on their plate. We send them into student teaching and they're learning how school works and who their teacher is. They're also, they don't have any idea necessarily what curriculum is being used. So no way to prepare themselves going in. We all have these different reasons that we're interested in curriculum. And I started poking around looking for data on curriculum because it's very close to like student learning and on all of these projects that we're doing. I couldn't find a way to just be able to say, all right, this school is using this curriculum for math, or this curriculum for ELA. I could find lots of information about test scores, about those two things. We're really interested in sharing our passion for not only curriculum, but other types of data beyond just test scores um, about our schools. Really with the, the sort of key here, the difference between the types of data I think we're gonna try to point out and hopefully share our passion with you is that formatted data that has like, test scores that have that are in like CSV or JSON format with school identifiers or student identifiers or things like that. And it's really easy for researchers and policymakers or folks to use them. And then there's a lot of other data that is open, but it's not accessible where it's, you can't just quickly use it. It's messy, it's curriculum, that's school services, like special, different special ed services that are offered in schools, multilingual or L services that it's, it's just really hard to get at. And we think it's really important to try to liberate that and make it possible for folks to interrogate it and to know about it. So the first question that I, I, I did want to start out with, and I think we, we wanted to address is it, test scores are important to some extent because there's a bunch of decisions being made about them. So we wanted to frame our discussion, starting with what is available and what's structured, and then delve into the things that are you know, curriculum. Maybe Tom, or do you want to talk about why, yeah, this is, why is the Sure. So when it comes to talking about K-12 compulsory education, like we need data to work with to understand like what works in schools, what are we basing decisions on, whether it's policy, funding, whatever it might be. And the kinds of data that we've arrived at as a nation has been achievement scores or, or test scores. And those test scores are, they're gathered from a couple of different places. And in fact, right now in New York State, if uh, anybody is the parent of a third through eighth grader, you will probably know from your school that like the ELA tests are coming later in this month. It'll be math the month after that. It'll be science for eighth graders right after that. And then it'll be the regents, New York State's exams as well. So these kinds of these kinds of tests, they do provide a proxy for like quality of a student's learning. What's important to also note, though, about these kinds uh, of data is that in the United States, every state tackles their achievement data differently. It's a state by state issue. And that's different than every other country we compare ourselves to internationally. So in any other country where you hear when the uh, PISA scores come out and it's the United States has fallen to 30th place in math or whatever it might be. Most of those other nations we're, we're comparing ourselves to, they actually handle all of this kind of achievement data collection at a national level. There's a national curriculum. There's a national ministry that manages the way in which schools execute on that curriculum. It's not to say there isn't freedom at the school level, that's just to say that like, it's all hand at a national level. We don't do that in the United States. The word education doesn't appear anywhere in a US constitution, doesn't appear in the Bill of Rights, doesn't appear in the Declaration of Independence, and neither do the words teaching, school, or anything like that. 
So what happens here is that it's actually a state by state issue and every state tackles it differently. Every state is all is on the hook to provide this kind of test score data to the federal government, mostly for funding purposes and sometimes for, you know, for, well, for legal as well. But it's handled state by state. So that's something really important to, to understand when we are talking about test scores. You'd be pretty confident talking about a state in terms of how and why, which exams they give, how and why. Whenever it comes to comparing states, it starts to get a little dicier. And certainly when it's about trying to compare our entire country to another country, it would be like taking 50 little countries who do their own thing, averaging their scores, and then calling that something. Is that helpful? Yeah. Yep. That context. Cool. Um, so that, you know, so Tom, you talk about how averaging our national test scores um, across 50 different states, which is comparing and compiling around 50 different countries, now even think about just the conversations that you all had when you're talking about your K-12 experiences. Those, imagine trying to just homogenize all of those experiences and report on it with a test score. And the work we do, we feel like every day, it's like, all right, we're, what we're doing and what we're trying to do, the changes that we're trying to make in schools are not reflected up to those test scores because it gets so rolled up. So I'd love to bring it down to that level. And that's where we'd like to stay for the rest of this is what is the actual experience going on in the classroom. And so maybe I, Steve, I talked to, to Tom about his learning experience, but maybe you could share yours and maybe a little bit about what in your work is the current state. Uh, sure. So I'm just going to somewhat build off of what Tom was talking about. So what are the consequences? If we're taking all these measurements, we have all these test scores. What happens if I do well? What happens if I do poorly? So as I was talking Tristan just a minute ago, my experience uh, is my background is in teaching. So I was a public high school teacher uh, for many years and also an elementary school teacher in the city. So right immediately, one of the first things that if your students do poorly, that reflects poorly in your own evaluation. So there's very real consequences for not only the students as far as their learnings, but there's very real consequences for the, the teachers that are involved. But the schools, if you consistently perform poorly, that they have, you're in threat of being shut down. If your district is doing poorly, funders, for better or worse, funders like myself, one of the things that we look at is test scores. That we, if we're investing tens of millions of dollars, that we want to see a return on investment. And for better or worse, one of the only measures that we have that we currently actually measure around is test scores. So I think that gives us somewhat of a little bit of the landscape of, of where we're at as far as some of the problems that we have. I would love to see if there was more information around, oh, what's the quality of teaching, right? What are the actual practices that are going in the classroom? Maybe I could measure and advocate for that. We don't have that type of information. And I think one of the things that end up happening is so many times now within funders, we have somewhat of a mentality of if you build it, they will come. So because we have so little control over so many other components. So what do I mean by that? So for example, Melinda Gates, four years ago, they invested $10 million into high quality instructional materials. Our Robin Hood Learning Tech does something similar. A lot of this, we don't know while we start getting to see early indicators that these are becoming effective curricula, but we largely don't know what this will actually look like in implementation. So there's some challenges that a lot of times we invest in things, we try our best to see and track what's actually happening, but we largely don't know. And then we then ask for the sort of test results, if you will, and see what is the result of that. So there's this whole gap from the time that we invest to the time that we actually see the, the results. And the time in between that is largely sort of a, a black box. And that's some of the work that we're hoping to, to do is to sort of reveal it. Maybe there are things that maybe the curriculum doesn't even matter, right? Maybe it's something else that's happening within the school. But for us, right now we're at, hard to really say. We know it's maybe inclusive, maybe strongly correlated, maybe not. But that's where we're at. I'll get off my soapbox. But generally where we're at as far as, especially from the funding first time. I'm riffing on the questions here as I hear what Tom and Steve are talking about. So it, the, I think Steve is pointing out that we don't know is we have a black box. So I think I'd, for all of you, I'd like to like open what is available right now. So Tom, maybe you want to talk about some of the data sources, either like inside schools or others that I can pull up while you're talking. It's occurring to me that, and we'll, we're talking about test scores as if they mean something. And in a certain way they do, as Steve was saying, but in another sense, you have to ask yourself, like, does a test score actually capture the quality of a child's learning experience? Does a test score actually capture 
the quality of a teacher's teaching experience. And it's, we could have a very long discussion about that, but the answer is not a simple yes. Um, the answer is probably not a simple no either. But it is to say that like the one like confident set of data we have that very important decisions are being made on, those data are like are complicated and they're flawed in a lot of ways too. And so we use this word curriculum, but we need to be clear about what we mean by curriculum. And there's like a, a there's a, a trifecta in teaching and pedagogy. So you have assessment, you have curricula, and you have instruction. Those are like the big three. And they relate to each other, but they're not the same. So the curriculum might be like this is, these are a scope and sequence lesson plans. It might be the textbook, might be the curricular material that, you're, that might be used in, in a lot of settings. But it's like what's been thought about in advance that maps to content standards, learning standards, educational research, learning research, and then what has been mapped in terms of a series of experiences or activities for students. You can have a curriculum that's really awesome that an inexperienced teacher doesn't understand well enough like what to do with it because it takes time to actually study it and to understand who are my kids that I'm trying to teach here, how does it relate with what's in the textbook or whatever it might be. And then you have these assessment data which take a lot of different forms, but it includes the um, high stakes testing data that we talked as well. So when we talk about curriculum, what we're really trying to fixate on is like, we should be able to see some sense of what is being taught in the schools. And the curriculum is not the standards. Sometimes that's a misunderstanding, like, well, we have learning standards, isn't that the curriculum? No, the learning, the curriculum is how somebody takes all of the content knowledge within a field, all of the learning standards, all of the values and things that a district or a teacher or a school might have, perhaps the kids' inquiries and needs and interests, I would hope as well, and you weave it all together in a series of learning experiences. Does that make sense? So it's like the curricular piece is crucial, especially when you're in a city that has such high teacher turnover if you're a new, there's a difference between being a new teacher with no curricular foundation at all and being a teacher who has some curricular uh, resources to draw on and support. So if anybody know like a new teacher in their lives, no, some, yeah, like they're probably freaking the heck out like in their first year, you probably hear them talking about, oh, I got to plan tomorrow's lesson. I got to plan tomorrow's lesson. I got to do this. Like that, that like racing to catch up is because they don't have that curricular foundation provided for them in a meaningful way and they're not supported in executing on it and learning about it. So in New York City, good transition. Yeah, thank you, man. In New York City, we have these standards. So I have math up right now, but if I click on English language large, you just focus on the top big two. So math had the standards linked and it had a curriculum called Go Math linked. In ELA, I don't See anything of that nature. That's right. And yeah, exactly. So like my son's 12, he's in a middle school here in the city in the Bronx. And the, his school is using a curriculum called expeditionary learning. So again, this is a private, I don't know if they're private or nonprofit. I don't know what their status is, but they're a company who's intentionally created an ELA curriculum right? and it's mapped to standards, but they're not the standards. It includes this. The standards won't tell you what text to teach, but it'll tell you like what aspect like of literacy you're trying to get at. And so you can pick the text, that kind of thing. So the, the curriculum would do all of that. His school uses expeditionary learning, but there's no, there's no official requirement for his school or all middle schools to use the same thing. So his school has made their own decision to use this particular uh, free curriculum. And the school right down the block might be using something totally different. And that's up to the principal. In some cases, a lot of schools, that's up to the teacher to decide like, how they're going to go about teaching stuff. You have up here ed reports. You want to explain what this is and why you pulled it up? Yeah. So Tom was talking about the curriculum that is his son's middle school use. So I, one of the tools that I'm using now as I try to figure out what curriculum might be used in different schools across the city, I need to know a you know, starting point. What are all the curriculum out there? So ed reports is one group that we've been talking to. They have a list of lots of curricula and then they create reports that I, I think are based on, I don't know, maybe Steve, you have more information on like where the, the sort of quality, they do quality ratings and they have some sort of process that, that they go through to say this curriculum meets X, Y, and Z standards. It might be common core standards or it might be something else like that, which maybe, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to talk about it. There's, there's a few things. Oh, they, they look at, and actually if you go into any of the 
comparable materials. They look at usability, alignment, several different factors. And that's, they give like a, I forgot the one to three sort of rating as far as if it's high quality. So the, the big question then becomes, okay, there's lots of different curricula out there. Why would you not use a high quality curriculum? Why wouldn't you just use something that's like a 36 across and all these different dimensions? Yeah, so it goes around complexity and things like that. Tom just mentioned that every school can choose their own curriculum. You could have 1,600 curricula for each and every school in New York City in all the different grades. And we know some of them are more vetted than others. Uh, some of them are newer. They're maybe experimental. They don't know what it's actually going to be uh, like in their classrooms. But large factor of that, too, is just marketing. Companies like Pearson's, they have the ability to go into schools, and they depend a lot of times on schools not knowing this information, this sort of ignorance of information and data and transparency. That, okay, if I'm a principal, I don't know ed reports. I don't know what these different uh, qualities look like. Pearson, whoever it is, it doesn't have to be Pearson makes certain projects that are good, but it could be any vendor comes in and, okay, sounds good. Looks good. You're going to provide professional development for me. I just have to pay this one price. And then let's go. Let's do it. So there's a level of importance of having access to this information. There's importance of actually making sure that it's not only that they're aligned, but one of the things I mentioned earlier, that's usable, right? If I give a, a teacher, here's a five, and they've done this in the past, here's a 500 page manual of how to use uh, a sixth grade ELA curriculum. As a first year teacher, like kids all over the place right now, you're just trying to figure out which way is north. I don't have the time to read through 200 pages for my next lesson. So there is a usability, not only just quality. So we have to take all these sorts of things into account. And I'll go ahead. Yeah, that's a great, that's a really great point. I guess one of the key things that I guess just to drive home to connect some of the dots and we have a question, it sounds like too, there's um, just to make it clear, we're saying that the test score data, the data that we have widely available to us is insufficient, right? It doesn't capture the phenomenon of learning and teaching sufficiently. We're saying that curricular resources are a key factor in the quality of instruction that happens at a school. There's a lot of researchers that will say that like quality curriculum is a prerequisite for quality instruction. We have 1,600 schools who are using their own curriculum, they're making their own curricular choices, and we have no easy way to actually see who's chosen what, why, for whom, and how well has it worked. That's the rub. And we have a question. Sorry, go ahead, ma'am. Yeah, my question was, I, I'm a little unclear what you're saying. Are you saying that you think that the information about all the different curriculums available should be shown somewhere where everyone can look at them? Is that what exactly. Saying? Thank you so much for that question. And it's actually, maybe that's a great prompt to transition into that part, Anki, where that is exactly the rub. We're looking at the New York City public schools from all these different perspectives and angles, and we're saying, how can this data set not exist? Like, how can we not see... It, in one glance, the curricula that have been chosen by schools and the effectiveness according to whatever metrics, like the, the effectiveness. And so uh, that's what Ankit and Steve embarked on. What are some of the qualitative thing, aspects of the curricula that you could aggregate? Or is it more just qualitative that you're looking for? Are you asking like specifically like data about cur different curricula? Yeah, like how do you get data about curricula? What are the, some of the uh, examples? So I think Ed, Ed reports is a great example about like how curricula be there there's some this group is trying to create quantitative data about curricula and in in, in I guess the, the it's almost like a question to, uh, that we an open question that we have is like how do we use this data is it like are there going to be issues with us applying this data to a repository of, of all the schools and what what curricula they use so it's a good question i don't really have an answer this is one source right now i don't know of other sources Looking at these, which look great, and thinking about like all the different things there are to measure a curriculum, I'm, given like the sort of inequitable funding in our school system, I wonder what role like curricular cost and the total cost of bringing whatever curriculum into a school, uh, what role like that data has in, in looking at what schools choose which curriculum. Yeah, so that that's a great point. I was unable to, in my digging, to find curricular like specific like purchase order information for curricula. Looking at school budgets, that stuff is rolled up into categories that don't offer that level of, of granularity. But that is a really important question because these different curricula have different costs. Steve was talking about the marketing of it, like that then results in maybe a higher cost. Some curricula like Engage and Wide is a statewide site. 
provides free curricula that is often thought of as very high quality. Okay. Oh, yeah. I was quite scared to what is a What's it called again? A uh, bed preach is it a uh, curation? It's curation. Um, C U R A T is like the curator. Yep. Uh, right. They is on if you were a teacher, you can go to ebweb.net because I take PD with them. It's, it's virtual, okay? And they actually, they, they just started as a brand new company or what have you, but these are teachers or administrators who got together and put together some type of website or something. But it's it's pretty reliable because I check myself. And then the second thing is a comment as well. New York City, and I agree, they have too many diverse curriculums. So it, it'll be quite difficult to actually compile and get a, a true sense of what's going on in the schools because every district, they run by district here, they're broken up into little, like, almost like open blocks because it's related to social economics. And so everything here is so complex, there's so many different layers. It'd be very hard, not to say you shouldn't do the job, right? So you should stop working, but you're going to have a challenge, so be ready for it. Yeah. Also, you have a question before, which is the point. what's the point question of like, what's the point of this? Um, as a parent, as a New Yorker, I should be able to, I should be able to see like how much money was spent on which curricula that is doing best by the kids or is like having the best effect on test scores or that teachers are. We should have some sense of which like if you're a school that serves this population, which math curricula like works best throughout the city. There's no easy way to find that simple information. But to Anki's point, in theory, it actually exists because everything is not everything is purchased. Lots of curricula are purchased, though. And anytime you put in a purchase, you're putting in codes in a database that's saying it's this curricula, this many I'm purchasing, this is my school, it's tied to all sorts of other information about the school, or you're creating your own curricula, which would be like its own thing. But it's like the data are there, but the city doesn't make them or require, they don't make them available. And you can, and this is the project that Ankit and uh, Steve embarked on, you can take these PDFs essentially that each school individually creates, they're called CEPs or comprehensive education plans. In those, the schools, the principals of the schools will say, oh, we're using Go Math or we're using expeditionary learning. It's, it's a doc that's been PDF, but you can scrape it and you can pull some of those data. And so that's what they, that's what they embarked on, but it's, they had to do it because this basic data set isn't even available. Yeah, so this is what our project work in progress that we wanted to share and hopefully inspire other work around liberating really important data from school. So like Tom said, so we had this interest, like, what is the curricula at, at, at schools? Can we aggregate it? Can we dimension in the back about the different districts? There are school districts that are separate from community districts. And so we wanted to be able to, to look at the curriculum in these different ways. So one way to get at this curriculum data, right now, the only way that I can think of or I've been able to find is looking at these CEP, CEPs. Um, so I'm going to show you one. There's so every year schools are required by I believe by like November, but to put together these comprehensive education plans that have information such as uh, they're just general school planning, their mission, their goals, what their sort of uh, smart goals are, their achievable goals for that year. Um, and the folks that put it together, are the school leadership team, it's the principal, assistant principals, parent coordinator, lead teacher. So these are the people that are like down on the ground, um, understand how a school works. They also put together important information about how to, uh, how they're serving English language learners, which is extremely important in this city. So it's actually like really two documents here. The English language learning pieces are, are driven by a, a different set of legal requirements. Uploaded, I think they're, they're created in Word, they're uploaded in PDFs, and, and it has a, a ton of great information that's Im almost impossible to get at it. So if, uh, for example, if somebody at the Robin Hood Foundation, a program officer, wants to look at a bunch of different schools and understand what's happening, they have to go into each one of these PDFs, look at them for different years, if they can get access to the ones in different, uh, you know, past years, and then control F and look for the stuff that they're looking for, or just read through all of this. I took the CEPs for the last 10 years, actually, yeah, from 2009, 10 school year to the 2018, 19, I still have to get the, the two years, um, 
in, in the intervening that were actually published, the pandemic, there was one year that were, they were not. And I pulled all the text out of them. And one project that we did over a, two summers ago was to just search for a specific set of curriculum that the Robin Hood Foundation was, had like their partners were using or their partner schools had reported using. And we looked to see across the city, what were, what was their usage? Then we're like, okay, now we know this sort of very, at a very like high level, this specific set of curriculum that the Robin Hood Foundation cares about, what other curriculum are available? So we started talking to ad reports and then how, well, then what are we actually going to do with this curricular information? We're, that's the step that we're at now. And actually like taking this text data, making it uh, searchable was the first step. Now actually like having a, like a, a clear reporting of schools with their curricula in math, in ELA, uh, social studies, science, along with any other contextual information is where we're going. Yeah, I don't have something to show you on that front just yet, but maybe Steve, do you want to talk about why you think that type of information would be helpful to you? To a state that we have a whole bunch of things that we evaluate different grants around. One of them is, comes, no surprise, usage, right? Like how many schools are actually using the curriculum that we find? So now we're able to actually so it's a, as Anki will show through the tool, we're actually being able to see that the system wide, city wide level before you'd have to actually go to the vendor and then be able to have them be able to share the information with you. And that may not even always be accurate, especially if you have open source curricula, like there's no one that's actually aggregating or there's some people, but they're not willing to share it. I'd say the other thing too, is uh, this is just a proxy. You, we could do curricula, but we could also look at practices too that I could just as easily search for a curricula, let's say, engage in New York. I could also search for project-based learning. I could search for other sort of key terms that maybe we see these shifts as they adopt these different curricula. Maybe we we're starting to see other substantive pedagogical shifts within school. So there's a, a lot of different things as a funder that we are really starting to explore through tools like this, whereas before, if I go all the way back to the, one of the first things I said we were primarily just looking at test scores because that was the only thing that we really and just sheer numbers of students that are actually using the curricula that those are the few things that we had but now we're opening up the world to, to things that we can look at so I'll, I'll pass it over to have you actually confirmed that the the finance department or whatever i don't know if the finance department is but if you sort of confirm that you can get sort of the better contracts and that way. So yeah, no, we have not foiled it. We've been using the existing open data tools uh, on schools and there's, there is a ton of information published. So for example, I'm on tools.nycenet.edu. I thought this is like one of the ways I went into the school budget reports. I couldn't find it there. I, I do believe because there is a roll up, I think, I don't know if we can look at budgets here. Those are, there's a different link for the school budgets on the NYC, on the schools at uh, NYC site. This gets into specific performance data. I, I know that this data exists, as Tom said, like there's purchase orders, there goes into a database that exists. We have not foiled it. We have other things that we have looked at. There's, uh, so the middle school and high school, because there's school choice in the city, we've looked at these direct uses, there's a ton of stuff that's in here. Curriculum is not reported in here. You'll have things like after school activities reported, but not curricula around um, ELA or math or the, those types of things. Probably worth also mentioning too, that a lot of the larger curriculums that people are using out are open source. So they wouldn't necessarily have that vendor contract outlined so we'd never see it. I'm curious if you have looked at the school survey data at all. Yeah, it's actually fill it out and maybe comments about and just from someone who works in the school, it was like it's easy for a principal to put on the CP, we're using GoMap, but then let the teacher close the door and do whatever they want. So I think the, the parent perception, because they're already there at the local level experiencing the curriculum and what's actually happening in the classroom. If you're not familiar, school survey, there's there's a huge uh, survey of teachers and students and parents every year. And that information is available on the DOE site. I'd have to pick a school here. The school survey information, I looked at it. There's nothing specific about this curriculum use or in, in there, it would be a sort of a very interesting uh, question to ask about whether you're using the curriculum that your school has purchased or not. This is an, another reason that we're, that we think using the CEPs could be potentially useful is that, that there are teachers in the room, um, they're, they're the leader, lead teachers, and so they are trying to, they're not like all of the teachers, but there is some level of like granularity that they're getting to. Uh, the CEPs are going not necessarily to central district, but they're going to the superintendents within, sorry, central office, they're going to the superintendents. So it's 
I, that I would love to know more. We've talked to some of the schools that are in Robin Hood programs about what's reported on the CP. How accurate is that? We're not sure how to necessarily gauge that. So that, that remains an open question. Earlier, I talked about there's assessment and there's curriculum and there's instruction. That's an imperfect kind of trinity, but it works. If you think about it more of a, as a V, like the assessment data is like the high level. It's really the states is all the high, the high stakes achievement data. The achievement tests are all the states. So you have the assessment data. You have curricular data, and then you have instructional data. Mostly what we're focusing on right now, acknowledging that it's instruction that you really want to get at, like what's actually happening in a classroom in 30 seconds between a, a teacher and a student, and why is that happening? Like that's where you really want to get. This curricular piece is means to that. In order to make sense of what happens in the classroom, the curricular piece also needs to be understood. There is also, I'll just say, like the whole city went online with the pandemic. There is a, there's a significant possibility for new kinds of data that relate to both curricula assessment and instruct from online and blended models as well, depending on how the city rolls it out. They've been very sheepish about sharing any of those kinds of data, including basic attendance data. So I don't think we should expect it anytime soon. But in theory, if the largest school district in the country is mostly using Google, Google Classroom at the middle and high school level, then we actually should have access to a certain kind of data about blended and online models of learning that could be could complicate in some interesting ways, like this question around the curricular and instructional kind of interplay. And a couple of these questions, like the question about have we foiled this information, it leads to some of the things we're hoping comes out of this session. One, this, that this data is very messy and it's been, I think, having some more structured ways to get at it would be great. Um, I myself don't, I'm more of like an open data hacker. Uh, working on teacher preparation. So I don't have that type of experience with FOIL. As we, we come here to hopefully find members of the community that can add those elements. So if you have that type of insight or if you're involved at your school and how CEPs are built, we'd love to talk to you about, do you think that this is the source of data to continue to inter interrogate to pull this information out of and to get closer to what, it, what our actual learning experience is like? And are there, is there data that we might be missing that you all were talking about your learning experiences and we never actually came back to that. Um, but is this like this layer of curriculum, is that still too high? You know, are we getting down to what your actual learning experiences are like? Uh, so those are asks that we have of you all. We'll be hanging out after this session. We really appreciate that everybody has engaged with us in this. It is certainly like evolving work. It's messy work, but it's really exciting to be here and to talk to all of you and to see everybody so, Tom, Steve, do you want to say anything in closing? For me, I think I want to underscore, I guess, what Ankit just said, like that opening activity that we did with like that, what was that moment that you remember as a student that like really impacted you somehow? We acknowledge that even curricular data is like really far away from that. Does that make sense? It's related to, but separate, meaning your teacher had some sort of intentional plan in all likelihood when you experienced that moment in a classroom. In some way, we see the curricular piece as helping understand how that's made possible. We acknowledge too that it's still a really far, it's a far leap from those kinds of moments too, which get closer to instruction. Steve, is there anything you want to say before we conclude? Sure. For, for ourselves. But, you know, I think generally, right, schools have been largely these big, big black boxes that we don't really largely know what's happening at this system -wide level. So now we're starting to finally be able to probe into it get an actual look at a system-wide level and all the other implications that we talked about today. Funding to pedagogical choices and approaches to different other curricular uh, consequences. But there's a lot to the best state and we're just at this sort of precipice. Okay, uh, we have all this information now, right? We have all this data dumped now. Now we're starting to figure out how, what can we actually do with it? And our starting point right now is this curriculum. So more to come, all this. Thank you. Thank you guys.